It's nice to talk to you. <laughs> They're doing all right, bro. It's been a crazy time for everybody, but we're here. We're breathing. Nothing I can complain yeah. about, man. I actually just did a uh, podcast with uh, Snake Sabo from Skid Row about mental health. We do it every week, and we had Tommy Dreamer as a special guest. It's up on oh, wow. 94.3 The Shark. I know I'm starting out with a shameless plug, but like we no, just that, did that's it right before spot. this. I was about to say you could already listen to Orlando at 94.3 The Shark, but man, <laughs> it's uh, that's incredible though. That's awesome. The, the fact that you had a legend like Tommy Dreamer up there with you. Like, I know, I know you guys are real tight. Like I remember seeing you guys in Patch that one night when uh, uh, Chris Jericho came down uh, to play for Fozzie about uh, back in 2016. Or was that 2017? You were doing security, right? Yeah, I was working at Patch Talk back then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was working. <laughs> that was a. What's going career. on with you? Uh, right now, basically, what I'm doing is uh, I'm personal training and nutritionist now. Uh, I basically uh, after I was honorably discharged from the military, I. Uh, was at the heaviest I ever was. And I was weighing at 283. Then I started going heavy with the gym. And from there, I went basically 56 pounds in about five months. And then from there, I grew a passion for actually teaching people how to lose weight, how to properly, how to lift properly. And from there, I started to really pursue a career in personal training. Uh, started working overnight for Planet Fitness while doing personal training in the daytime. Now I'm working for Unique Fitness over in Holbrook as a full-time uh, nutritionist and personal trainer there. And doing this on the side is uh, talking about and raising awareness about mental health. That's one of my key things about personal training as well. And being that it's Mental Health Awareness Month, I had to have you on here because of multiple reasons. Uh, from back when I can remember the, the suicide walk, but be back uh, that rainy, rainy day in 2019, walking... <laughs> And Bro, I was punched in the face in my life softer than that rain hit. That rain was the most brutal beatdown I ever felt in my entire life. Like, I'm not, no exaggeration. I never felt anything like that. It, it, Chicken Little was running around it. screaming, the sky was falling. <laughs> uh, and it, then also the debut of your song, Choose Song. Um, yep. Talk a little bit more about that, uh, the creation process about it and how everything came to fruition. Well, it's funny because I actually wrote it the day I saw you in Patchog, what you were just talking about. It was the day after Chris Cornell passed away and yeah. the news hit me like a ton of bricks. So I just wrote the lyrics and then I forgot about it for a good year. Brendan from Weedus and I were hanging out one day and he made a joke about me writing a song one day. And I said, well, I have one. Why don't you take a listen? So that led to me going to his house in Northport. We sat up in his father's attic for seven hours and he fleshed it out, helped me fine tune the lyrics. And then he put some music to it. I drove home that night, listened to it. It was just an acoustic song at the time. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I have a song. And then we sent it to Vinny from Sponge and Kevin from Candlebox. And it was Kevin that said, bro, we need to make this to do they know it's Christmas time and suicide prevention. So that's how it started. And then we gave the demo to Sponge. And then they, they were the guys that fleshed out the music. And, you know, then the story unfolds from there. So um, it, it's interesting because I didn't know what it was going to mean to me, you know, we wrote the song that we, we, we did that video with, um, with Ashley Massaro, who was one of my really good friends. The way we did it at the time, sending GoPros to each other, Kevin set his up in LA, Vinny in Michigan, Brendan in Northport, Ashley in Ronkonkoma. We were in three different, uh, three different States, four different towns. You know, we brought people together pre-pandemic, pre-Zoom. You know, that's how we filmed the video in different parts of the world. Wow. And then the final part of the video was filmed at the 1940s brewery. That was an amazing night. They, we filmed it in Holbrook on a night that the brewery was closed. I think you couldn't be there. I think you had to work that night. Right, I believe so, yeah. Sent an email out and talked about it on the air. I said, look, if you want to be a part of a video about mental health, email me and I'll send you the location. And all I said 
we didn't really get into who was going to be in the video or, hey, you want to be hanging out with rock stars. We just said, do you want to be a part of mental health? And all but one of the 81 people were there for mental health. There was one person that was there to try to score Motley Crue tickets, but everybody else was there for the cause. <laughs> and, Always trying to get tickets off here. Any, any time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was recorded on January 8th. And then the video was completed in April. And, you know, just when we were about to release it, we lost Ashley to her mental health battles. And rest in peace. Yeah, that, that made me want to scrap it. We did. We scrapped it for a year. And, and then to actually see her in the video now, I'm sure is definitely a little bit more of a, an emotional connection now with, with the song and with the video in, compared to where it was before. So Brandon and I didn't want to release it. Vinny thought it was really important that we show that this could happen to anyone. We were just afraid that it was going to seem too ironic. And Kevin was on board too. He goes, bro, I think you have to show it. I think you have to show that this can affect everyone. But it just didn't feel right. You know, Ashley, Ashley was my friend. And not that they were coming from a bad place. They were coming from they were right. It just, it didn't seem right to me at the time. No, I know. I see, I see exactly what you're saying because you don't want to be disrespectful at the same time. It, yeah. it does it's want to be like, it, it was a planned thing to do. Like it, 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 it sounded like it'd be like too Hollywood scripted. Like, you know, I completely, I completely see exactly what you're saying, but the fact that you guys uh, still released it, the song really can hit home and relate to a lot of people who deal with mental ailment. You know, it's a, uh, it's something that's more, talked about talked about more often unfortunately due to the people that we've lost but at the same time it's a topic where it everybody can relate to because everybody knows somebody that has some type of mental ailment i think when the pandemic happened those that were passionate about this got louder i don't think that more people started talking about mental health right away. I think a lot of people tried to ignore the mental health aspect. Look, we talked about social distancing and that word always bothered me from the beginning because the, the word social goes against everything that we should have been doing. Yes, we needed to be physically distant. We needed to be safe, but we yeah. should have been encouraging each other to go on Zoom and call and, and yeah. yell out the window to the neighbor the entire time. I, Nobody wrapping his door for toilet paper and trying to take away from the from right. one another instead of helping thy neighbor. You act people actually were acted in a more selfish manner than before, and also you saw the result of that just being them locked in the house for a month, two months that they had to actually deal with their own mental thoughts, their own traumas, their own things that they couldn't run away from anymore, and they couldn't suppress it from their job. And you saw the, the suicide rate skyrocket over the last year just because of that that time. People lost their businesses. People lost their jobs, their careers, their livelihoods because they couldn't maintain their money. They lost their homes. Some people got divorced. Some people lost their families. It's a uh, it, it the, what this past year did to the mental to just mental health in general. It now also put people into a more on their toes kind of state because now what if this ever happens again? You know, it's funny because some reports have listed that suicides didn't go up, but they said, but they, in the same report, they mentioned that drug overdoses skyrocketed. Well, what do you think a drug overdose is? You know, especially when you're home alone in your basement with nothing to do. It, it was really difficult to look at the TV and talk about all the physical distancing that we needed to do and not get into what we needed to do to keep ourselves mentally sharp. That's the reason why we, we released the video. We did a telethon in May, and it wasn't to take away from the first responders and the nurses and doctors, but all you heard about was the heroes in healthcare. They deserved it, but so did everybody else that sacrificed their own mental health to stay home and keep everybody else safe. So did everybody that was doing the right thing the entire time and not putting anybody else at risk. These people were isolated. Not everybody had families. Some people had nobody to talk to, but they stayed home just so nobody else would die. And we, we decided to do a podcast, uh, 
telethon for them. And we got a lot of talent together, comedians, musicians, actors, actresses to send messages. And we ran it through our Facebook page. It was one of the coolest things we've done. And it was after that day that Vinny said, look, we need to release this video. People need to see it now. So I went to Ashley's family. Vinny was on the phone and we asked for permission and they gave it to us. Her mom was fantastic. You know, like, I think everybody needs to see this because Ashley did fight to the end. You know, you hear, well, somebody took their life. They gave up. It's not that simple. And in this video, you could see somebody who struggled with mental health fighting literally to the day that she lost the battle. And you see in the video, she has a smile on her face. You, you see in the video that it, it, it doesn't look like she's exactly in that state of depression, but anyone who truly has dealt with depression, whether you have it or whether you see people or you have family that are really close to you that, that have it, you see, I want to say, pain in the eyes. You, you, there's different, it's a different um, type of energy that you're around when you notice that somebody's putting on a mask the whole time. You know, nobody really knows this. I might have mentioned it once or twice, but she had a paid gig that night of the final portion of the video shoot, and she blew it off to be in this video for free. Nobody got paid for that. No one took a dime. That was all done on everybody's own time. Kevin spent his own money to go to a studio in L.A. The band in Michigan, they poured hours into that song, and Ashley could have went to work that night, but instead she helped us with our mental health initiative, which I'll never forget. Wow. It's incredible. Honestly, it's, uh, it, it, it's a shame that she didn't get a chance to physically see what the, the song can do for people and what it did for you guys as well. Uh, Cause now also it, it expanded now to a, uh, a local um, IPA is correct. We got a beer out of it, man. A beer it's, out of it, yes. It's pretty crazy. You know, The John from the 1940s brewery, John Brengel, approached me around Christmas time. I had nothing to do with the idea of this thing. And he said, I want to give back. You guys do so much. I feel like we could do something together. You know, you guys were so good to us. I'm like, look, John, you're the one that gave us your brewery to use, like, we owe you but he came up with this idea of a tequila inspired beer because i love tequila so that's why the beer is lime flavored and i was driving to queens with my friend tara to pick up her kids that day and i'm like man i wonder if there's a way where we could like stick a picture of the video on the side of the can she's like dumbass you never heard of a qr code <laughs> I had a lot of help with this. It was like, not me at all. And then I approached John with that idea and, and that's how it happened. The press we got from that was amazing. The, the amount of people that reached out and wanted to cover the never alone beer. I mean, look, you have a beer. And again, a lot of times there's a stigma with drinking, right? There's negative stigma and it leads to all kinds of problems, but you also have to realize that there's people drinking by themselves or drinking in a bad place. And, if they look at that can, not only will they have an inspirational song to look at if they scan their phone to the can, but there's inspirational quotes on the can. The suicide prevention hotline is on the can. You know, it, it's not just a regular beer. It, it's, it's really there to turn whatever negative you might face from drinking into a positive. And that's incredible. That honestly is incredible because that, that's, that's thinking way outside of the box. And it's also thinking for the best of the community as well. Not that many people who are putting out alcohol are really thinking, you know, best things for the community. They think of more of celebrations, parties and everything. Not, not that one guy who's sitting, a guy or gal who's sitting in the basement right now who, are, who is literally day drinking their way right now, who literally just woke up, just crack open something. Like it's, it's somebody who can turn that can and see that quote and maybe they read, they don't always notice one of those quotes and then they read one and it hits home and then that just sets off a chain reaction. Like you never know how much that little much of a detail could put of a impact in somebody's life. We've seen it every time, you know, somebody could be struggling with mental health for years and it's that one day that one incident, you don't know what it is, 
So that's why to have that information readily available to know. All right. So real quick, guys, sorry. I just want to take a break from the podcast, talk a little bit about your next supplement purchase and as well as uh, your next energy drink purchase, your next protein purchase, basically your next life enhancement purchase. Uh, Before you make that next one, I want you to take a look into probably one of the best companies that's on the block currently right now. Uh, and is also one of the most badass companies currently right now. And that company is Origin Maine, uh, as well as the branch off of it, Jocko. So Jocko's uh, supplement line, uh, I take personally. Uh, I take Super Krill, as well as the Cold War, which is an immune system boost. And my favorite, mm. Jocko Milk Protein. So what's key and was very, very different about this magnificent beautiful creation is it's sweetened with monk fruit monk fruit is better for your body and as well as a uh better for your blood sugar it is assistant with weight loss it brings a system has it is dude i can't fucking speak english right now it assists with weight loss uh and as well as has digestive enzymes already infused in the protein powders and it also has uh, infused probiotics. Sounds like two less supplements that you guys spend money on. Literally, everything is already inside of the protein along with your protein. It's also a time-release factor protein, uh, meaning that it's not going to just immediately burn through your body. It's actually going to help your body recover from the intense workout that you put yourself through or if you're just looking to have a nice little sweet shake to kill the cravings, I 110%, especially for the chocolate lovers, chocolate one is by far probably the best chocolate protein I've ever tasted, and I firmly will stand by that ground. And their Jocko Go, uh, the Jocko Discipline Go. Uh, so basically what that is, is a natural neurotropic energy drink. Has no more than about 95 milligrams of caffeine compared to other energy drinks that are popular right now, ranging anywhere between 200 to 300 milligrams of caffeine leaving you jittery up all night so this being less than a cup of coffee and more focused on neurotropic energy than just caffeine energy i 110 percent recommend that as well i everything everything that this company has i have yet to have tried to a bad have yet to have tried a bad product if only i could speak this right for them so use my code welsh10 for 10 percent off your next shipment again welsh w-e-l-s-h-10 10 percent off your next shipment and yeah thank me later there we go. This is the first time I've ever zoomed on my phone, so. I mean, let, let's see how it works. How do I sound? Sound pretty good. I'm not going to get better looking. That's not going to happen no matter what <laughs> I do. So anyway, where were we, my friend? Uh, I believe you were talking about the release date of... Uh, yeah, of true song. So after we got permission from Ashley's parents, we released it, I think, July 11th. Oh, we were talking about the beer. We were talking about yeah, the never. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. The beer got, there was renewed interest in the video that, I, you know, has now been out for about 10 months. And I mean, look, the response has been great. It's been modest i think we have like twenty five thousand views which is great but we would love to spread this throughout the world we want everybody to see ashley's story our story we want everybody to hear the message you know it's very simple to, to especially put on the a that ashley had you know you uh you would think that more people will recognize who she is well i do i think this is a taboo issue i think suicide and suicide prevention will always be a taboo issue i've reached out to many different media outlets throughout the years with many different projects that I've had and heard nothing. It's not an easy thing to talk about. Like I don't blame people for being scared to talk about this. It's it's a a topic where, especially if you lose somebody uh, to suicide, it it could trigger certain emotions. And then later on, those emotions will then trigger deeper thoughts. And then you're stuck in the whole rut throughout the next day. Like that, those are the kind of emotions that people don't realize that also intertwine when it comes down to mental ailments and suicide. It's just that the, the after effects of when you lose somebody to it, it uh, definitely weighs heavier. 
Yeah, but look what you're doing. I mean, the whole correlation between mental health and physical health. You know, another big problem with the pandemic is that the gyms were shut down for so long. Yeah. And I got angry after phase four was announced and the gyms weren't a part of it. Well, they never talked about a phase five. So we didn't know when we were going to get that back. Yeah. That was a coping mechanism. You know, having a, a, a release, a physical release is so important to mental health. I mean, what you're doing is fantastic. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you the, the, the feeling of actually being back in a gym when they first opened up me being a trainer and everything. It, it was damn near put me to tears just because it was just that much meaningful because I had just before the pandemic had hit, I had just finally earned my certifications and was about getting ready to really go full swing into my personal training nutritionist business. And then boom, all the gyms shut down. So then I had only to do training in the parks or I would do training uh, in home at people. I tried to give some type of routines, but I, people weren't able to always stick with the routine because they didn't have the proper equipment or they just weren't motivated enough. And it's hard when you're home, man. It really yeah. is like at, uh, an elliptical machine. It became a coat rack. It's my fault. I get it. <laughs> you know, like I could have used it more, but. The gym is such an important factor in working out. People don't realize because I it used to drive me nuts. We'll work out at home, work out at home. It's not the same. It's not. It's absolutely not. Because when you have that environment, because it's also an energy thing. People don't yeah. realize when you're in the gym and you have all that energy around you, you have other people who are trying to better themselves, who are trying to actually like improve yep. their lives, whether it's just being more out and social or it's getting physically strong, shredding some weight. Uh, it's all someone it's, it's everybody's trying to do something better for themselves and you just your net body just naturally thrives off that energy and when you're just working out by yourself and you have no motivation around you it's just like uh, all right i was ready to stop right here exactly i mean look i'm 43 years old i have bad hips sometimes i feel sorry for myself about it then you go to a gym you see some 60 year old lady and she's trucking away on the treadmill. And it's like, I need to man up. I need to keep going and press forward here. And you're right. Being around other people is so important. Yeah. And that gym atmosphere is, is, is vital to anyone that wants to get in shape. Yeah. Especially if you're looking to really improve, not only the physical aspect of your life, but mental aspect of life, because yeah. most of the people that are in the gym also have some type of, mental stuff that they're going through as well most people and they want to surpass that and they want to silence it when you actually strain your muscles and you work your ass off and you put yourself into that sweat the the, the, the mental clarity you have after it is just nothing like it there's no there, there's no true feeling of being that calm when you're natural like it's a naturally a, a natural anti-anxiety I mean, look, man, I think all of us go through some sort of mental issue every day, even if it's not what some would consider to be a problem. We all doubt ourselves. We all put more pressure on ourselves than we should. We all lay awake at night thinking, did I lock the car door? Did I leave my email open at work for my coworker to read a private email and find out that I really don't like them? You know, like, we all put ourselves through more than we should. And we all need now. Working out is not for everybody. And I get that. But it could be collecting stamps, baseball cards, whatever it is. We all need some kind of outlet. For me, it's music. That's why we did Choose Song. That's why we have the Never Alone beer. You know, that message will always be my thing. With music, you are never alone. You put on a song. It could be the saddest song in the world. And you can be depressed. But when you hear somebody else relate to you when you hear that there is somebody else that feels the way you do you don't feel alone anymore and the saddest song becomes the highest motivator yeah absolutely it, it, there's nothing like when you have that emotion to actually let yourself feel it when you have to let, let yourself feel these emotions and then you have to allow yourself to heal that's the only way to heal is to allow yourself to feel Allow yourself to feel so you can actually release this, release what you have built up on the inside out in the open, release it to the world, release it to the universe for it to take control of, and then be able to actually now focus on what you can physically now control. 
and having music like that show it has been scientifically proven uh, i want to say uh stanford university i believe that the re uh, research out of stanford or stony brook did the uh, uh recent research that when you are in a more saddened state the the music that you'll always listen to will tend to be music that just focuses on the uh negative aspect but no show, shining light compared to where your song there's a shining light there's actual it's a song where you could listen to it at that in that kind of state but at the same time you're going to feel elevated at the same time Bro, I'm a grunge kid. I grew up in the 90s as a teenager when everybody was angry. And in the 90s, things were doing fairly well. I mean, there was an economic boom. Everybody had jobs. But for whatever reason, we teenagers were angry. And <laughs> Doc Martens and the flannels. And the music was angry. But the music like was the real. Like the pair, ripped up jeans. Oh, yeah. Middle fingers out to society. And, and that was me. You know, what, whatever we were going through reflected in that music and those musicians really understood teen angst at the time because maybe our parents were seeing bonuses in their paychecks maybe the economy was doing great but it didn't matter there were a bunch of angry kids and that song that i wrote was just my way of coping with chris cornell's death i couldn't understand how one of my heroes somebody that seemingly had it all took his life like that i didn't know it was going to be this really it was a dream come true my heroes kevin martin candlebox was I say, like, you got to work with candle you had to work with candlebox yeah. that's that that's pretty big that, that's <laughs> that, that's not something that every, every long islander can say that they did well, i mean here's the thing when i was 15 years old i had tried to commit suicide one time and my, my home life was, was, was rough, and I was out for a jog one day with my Walkman, and my candle box tape snapped, right? And, like, that was it. You know, for a 15-year-old that was going through a lot of stuff, my one outlet, my emotional release was broken. And I had the, the broken tape in my hand, and I was furious with everything going on in life. I'm like, that's it. I'm done. And there happened to be a, a bottle, a beer, green beer bottle, not to do product price placement, but <laughs> on, on the ground, and it was broken, and I, I grabbed it. I was going to go down to the lake, and that was it. And I walked onto the sand, and a car had happened to pull into the parking lot of the lake, and out of the windows, Candlebox was blasting. It was the song You. And wow. I remember... I just stood there like dumbfounded. You know, I had this bottle, this broken beer bottle in my hand, the broken tape in the other hand. And within minutes, my problem was solved. I had this song. I'm standing at the lake and there's the song playing for me. So I went home that night and I requested Candlebox by a DJ named Captain Kevin. Talked to him for a couple of minutes. He was really cool, gave me words of encouragement, and then he played my song. He dedicated it to me. So fast forward 20 years later, Kevin and I had become friends, and he's been nothing but a wonderful ally to the radio stations that I work for. And I'm on my phone talking to him, and I had bent down to tie my shoe, and when I looked up, I realized, I, no joke, I was at that same exact corner where my tape broke 20 years earlier. Holy and I thought about ending it all. So, you know. Universe of God works in mysterious yeah, ways. I didn't know at first when I wrote True Song that Kevin was going to be a part of it. But after Brendan recorded that demo for me, how could I not ask him? And the Sponge guys, the time that they put into it. You know, I grew up on Rotting Pinata. It was one of my favorite albums. I'd sit in the back of the bus with my headphones on and just shut out everything that was going on and listen to those songs over and over again. So to have these guys put their stamp on it, you know, it's not a proud thing, but let's face it, suicide and the nineties have a strong correlation. Yeah. You know, look, look what we lost a couple months later after Chris Cornell passed away. We, we lost literally right. the voice of the nineties for the grunge for, for heavy, 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 heavy rock. Yeah. And then, 
one of the the first album I actually ever was able to purchase on my on my own was Lincoln Park Hybrid Theory. I was able to I was able to take the little ten dollars I I you know I earned my allowance and I went to down to the uh, Target with mom and paid for my own CD and that was an album where it just you know at the time for myself being the little fat pudgy white kid that I was being like being always beaten up everywhere I went and but it didn't matter if it was that my family's uh, my cousins were beating me up went to school I was getting beaten up I would, I would be around the friends I was getting beaten up so it was just a, a major aspect of my life where I, that connection of what Chester Bennington was able to bring it really I want to say resonated when I, I had my suicide attempt a year later after that, back in uh, 2018, uh, literally about a month after I had got honorably discharged, I was in my lowest state as well. And I had down half a bottle of Jack and I took a couple, uh, about a couple of different variations of pills, perks, oxys, and down the wall, threw it up literally within 30 seconds. And after I was laying in a puddle of my own vomit, just looking down and I put back on Lincoln Park and I just reflected back to those days. And then I really looked in the mirror and went to sleep, woke up the next day and went on this whole now, now mental journey. And now I, that connection of what Chester was able to do for the mental health community and talk about is something that I was always wanting to do intertwining now the personal training, uh, but also now through the podcast world as well. Uh, I may not have a large following currently right now, but that's not the goal. And the goal is to just change people's lives. The goal is to change at least one person's life to connect with home. If you look in the comment section of True Song, there are a couple of strangers that didn't know each other that started talking about their attempts. And those people were reaching out to each other and they were encouraging each other on the thread and possibly saved each other's lives. That's all I wanted. It doesn't matter who. Look, you could speak to 20,000 people and nobody listens. If one person gets the message and is encouraged to live, is encouraged to fight, then that's what matters. I'll always say I, I'm not proud of trying to take my life, but I will always talk about it. It's a fact. It happened. And it's nothing that I'm ashamed of. It, you never know who can help. You never know who the third party, third party listener. It happens all the time in the gym. The third party listener will always sometimes chime in if the, the connection to the conversation is that deep with them. And especially in the, with the topic of mental health, if you're talking about a suicide attempt and out in the open like that, it shows that not only have you grown from it, but you're ready to help out people who have gone through it as well. And people will sometimes take a look at that as their sign to not do it that night or if they have to have something planned to step away from that plan. Well, they always say it's a split second decision. You could be thinking about it for years, but it's a split second decision to actually do it. And if you could just be with somebody, if you could just send a text out, you know, we have a second video it's a cover of Stevie Wonder's I Just Call to Say I Love You. And it's with that same message. Like every once in a while, think about those that you haven't spoken to in a while. Just send a text, hey, thinking of you. It might seem cheesy. It might seem, and, and it might go ignored. Like, hey, they're busy. But it also might be the difference in somebody's day. And that difference could be life saving. Yeah. And you, you just don't know it. You don't know unless you have been in that situation where if you've been in a low state and just a random text out the blue came to your came to your phone and says, "Oh wow, I haven't talked to that person in so long," and then they just wish me. Like, it's, it's a different emotion that takes over. She's like, "Wow, they're actually someone's thinking of me out there." Like someone. Well, the day Chris died, I was on the air, and it was really emotional to have all of the listeners calling in asking me if I'm all right we were checking in on each other everybody was calling in with the Chris Cornell stories and emailing back and forth and then around 10 o'clock in the morning which would be seven o'clock California time I'm in the middle of a break I'm talking about Chris and I see it's a text message from Kevin and he just said hey man I don't know what's going on in this crazy world but 
there's got to be some light somewhere. Are you okay? And I'll never forget that. It was my motivation to writing True Song that night because I thought to myself, look, I get it that he was a hero of mine, but Chris was Kevin's friend. And here he is checking on me and asking me if I'm okay. And I just thought that that connection to music and how we were all brought together somehow. And even though Kevin knew I didn't know Chris, but he knew how affected I was because of what Chris meant to me was why I wanted to write that song. And I went home within hours and wrote it basically because of that text message. Yeah, man, I, I can't, I can't fathom like the things that goes on, what goes on through his, what went on through his brain, like the, the, the split decision of the, the way of doing it. Like this, the, the, the hanging was, it, it's, it's something that you, you you can't imagine like right? that, that, that of a long time of just sitting there with just being compressed or just having something physically around your neck, but the it's it's been the one thing that's been mentally around your neck holding you down the whole time, and then people now physically see what was really behind the mask, what was really behind everything. It's a it's a very scary symbolic showing of what the pain and trauma they were going through in their in their minds at the time and it, i don't think a lot of people can put those two things together when it comes down to the actual side of like not only the, the suicide but the way people do it as well no because it was a wake-up call chris cornell to me and to millions of people was a god yeah He's one of the voice biggest of a god voice right. of a god like that, 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 that. no he, one else liked him his voice was the most identifiable of the entire generation his band was one of the biggest of a generation we would look at him and be like oh my god you have everything you're a rock star hot chicks big house sing you're the coolest friends when chris passed when he took his life a lot of us were forced to realize that it doesn't really matter what people have that doesn't have squat to do with mental health when you're at your lowest when you're at your lowest you can't see what you have and look i'm a local dj by no means do i think i am a celebrity or a rock star by any means but i know on a local level if rob and i go somewhere we have to be careful with the things we say. We have to be careful with the things we do. Yeah. When I moved into my house in Ronkonkoma, that night, I never unpacked anything. My friend Ashford was over. She's like, I got to use the bathroom. I said, well, go. She goes, dummy, I'm a girl. I need toilet paper. I got to pee. So I had to run next door to my neighbor and borrow a roll of toilet paper. Day one, hi, I'm your new neighbor. Can I have some toilet paper? And... I go to walk back next door. A car passes. I don't think anything of it. The next day, I get a direct message on my Instagram. Hey, Orlando, was that you walking down the street holding a roll of toilet paper? I was outside. Yeah, that's that. pretty creepy. That's pretty, that's pretty creepy. But now think about what a Chris Cornell goes through every day of his life. He's internationally known. He, as soon as he steps outside, he's on camera somewhere. Somebody is looking and knows what he's doing. And it's not a justification for what happened. But I think when he passed, we all started to realize there is a lot more to being a celebrity than being cool. It is a job, yeah. a responsibility. And at times it could be an albatross. Yeah, it, it, having all those eyes on you 24-7, having all those flashing lights and everything surrounding you, anytime that you go, you can't do anything in peace. You can't do anything with your family. Like, it's without being recorded. You can't right. have people run up. Like it's, it's not a, re a real re natural human lifestyle. And look at public reception to going mad. When Britney Spears went nuts, shaved her head, attacked the paparazzi with the umbrella, you know, people made a joke about it. In the meantime, there was a girl in her early 20s that was unraveling and nobody stopped to say, oh, my God, she needs help. It was ha ha. Look at Britney. You know, there you go. That that epitomized how we looked at mental health at the time. And yeah. For a girl that was literally a, 
sexualized since she was 15 years old yep to the public yep she can't even take care of her kids properly without all the cameras and everything following her she had creepy people asking about her breast size when she was 17 years old Mm -hmm. it's stuff like that that's it's disheartening and it's disgusting and shit like that it's just not surprising when somebody goes off rail like that no but we acted surprised the general public acted surprised and think we're learning as a society to be a little more sympathetic and to be a little more understanding it's It's taken a long time like it's it's not hard it doesn't cost you anything to have empathy for somebody right it's you know, maybe nobody can understand what it's like to be Britney Spears' international pop star, but you sure as hell know what it's like to be Britney Spears' mom, Britney Spears' woman. You know, it's that breaking it down to a basic understanding that we're finally starting to get to a point where I think we are. You know, mental health has come a long way in the last couple of years. Oh, absolutely. You're doing your thing. We're doing our thing at the shark. So many people are more willing to speak about it now. And the more people that do this podcast you're doing right here is a major part of the movement. We need to keep going. Somebody's going to see this podcast. Maybe somebody starts their own by all means, the more the merrier. We'll both go on that. Of course. course. There there we go. Yeah, exactly. Real quick. Now the, the, just being a local DJ and everything, you're not just a local DJ, but you're a, you are a, a genuine voice for a uh, a community of Long Island where who actually grew up like from like the working class in the working class of the nineties and eighties. Like there's the majority of my family that uh, I talk to is like I'm talking to one of my families right here. It's like it's literally <laughs> it's like you're you're and the fact that you had the voice in the morning. It's you're, you have the voice of the working class because everyone's going into work when you're on. Everyone's driving into uh, driving into work. Everyone's getting ready for work where they have you playing in the house. You know, there's it's a it's a voice well, where it's easy recognizable as well. The second you hear your voice, it's like, yep, there's Orlando. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Look, I was a Long Island commuter for years. I drove a truck. I delivered for a company called T.A. Morris, delivered government frozen food. I know what the Long Island commute is. I did it my entire life. I was born in Queens. I grew up in Ronkonkoma. When I'm in the car with you, that's exactly how I feel. Okay, so I'm sitting behind the microphone. But when you call in and talk about an accident at this corner or this street is blocked because of a down wire, it's like, yep, that was every Tuesday of my life forever. And you know, I still have to get to and from the radio station. I still sit in traffic every day on the way home. I understand exactly what that commute is. Yeah, LIE cannot drive. (laughs) You cannot drive out east in the morning. No, you can't drive out east in the afternoon. You can't drive out west in the morning. In the morning. My mom worked two jobs. My dad worked 17 hours a day. I know exactly what a Long Island lifestyle is. I have a landlord. I have to pay rent too, man. You know, it's like we're all – when – people say we're all in this thing together you could roll your eyes you could say that sounds cheesy but that's a hundred percent true we all have to take the same commute you know some of us might have it easier but we all go through the red light camera frustration we all go yeah. through tax increases the gas prices going up we're all going through it and we should all understand that we can help each other Exactly. If people just start putting more focus in, in on the that part right there of actually helping your neighbor, helping somebody else that's right next to you, helping the, that family member instead of always shutting the door and being the greedy person and keeping yourself going, like keeping the blinders up and just not looking at anybody else. Like it, it's easy to be cold hearted. It's easy to be an asshole. It's easy to be like somebody that can really uh, just be a genuine slam of life. It's easy to be that it's hard to actually care because you actually have to bring out an emotion where it's not necessarily one that you show everybody the like a, a, a love like not love but a love like emotion of kindness and the more kindness that you share the better that you can be you have to have patience to care yeah. like i don't think that people are inherently selfish i don't but i do think that a lot of us are inherently lazy and a lot of times it is just easier to focus on ourselves and not look at what other people are doing at the same time 
when you put yourself out there, a, a lot of times people use helping each other as an excuse to not help themselves. Like the other side of that spectrum is you look at the people that are donating to charities, volunteering all of their time, and then they go home and their home life's a mess because they're too busy helping everybody else. Exactly. So more balance and we all just help each other a little bit. Those that do have the natural uh, yearning to want to help might have just a little bit more energy to do so more efficiently if we all just chipped in a little bit more. And not even just the financial aspect, just chipped in emotionally. And that's, that's exactly, it's just literally just something that's not, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost it, you to be empathetic. It doesn't cost you to be a little bit kinder. Like it just, Holding the door open for somebody, uh, being helping somebody out gets enough. Like myself, being six foot three, the amount of times I walk into the grocery store and I get asked, "Hey, can you, can you help me get off the top shelf?" Like, yeah, sure, it's no problem. <laughs> Go up and grab it and bring it down. Like it, it's a, uh, it's something that I, I actually genuinely do deal with. And then, it, of course, also if, if there's someone that's older in, in the store and they're, they're struggling with their groceries, what are you going to do? Just walk right past them? Like they, it, it, it's you got to help out when you can help out, no matter what. And just being able to help out in a little, little bit, just a little in the littlest things, little changes, a, a little, a smile walking past somebody like that smile could be like this way. Like, oh, okay. Unless you're a creeper, you can do it like a little, little creeper smile, like a Jack Nicholson smile. Then of course, <laughs> then, then they'll, then they're going to look at you a little crazy. But if you have this sort of genuine, like a genuine smile of just like, how you doing? Yeah. Just like, okay. Like that person, could, I, I, I think I could talk to him. I agree, man. I think that the importance of Zoom throughout this whole thing, because we were all masked. And I know that it was necessary. And I'm not getting into the debate of masks. That's for other people. Yeah, that's about. for the, the, the people who actually care. Right. You know, all I know is the one thing about masks that was detrimental, I think, to mental health was we couldn't see people's expression. We couldn't see what people were going through. It was point. That, that is a really good I'm point. I'm not taking anything away from it, but we, we needed to have a real conversation about it because as necessary as it was, it was a detriment to mental health. And we were going through more. Oh, I think you're getting a phone call. We through more. <laughs> we were going through more mental damage than was acknowledge because of that look we all walked into a store and all you could see were people's eyes right we were all going through a lot of pain if we were able to see each other's smiles it could have helped we couldn't i understand that but we also needed to talk about the fact that because we couldn't see each other's smiles our anxiety is heightened walking into a store our anxiety was heightened to begin with because we were afraid to get sick, but we also couldn't relate to each other anymore. Yeah. We were all faceless. And all those, yeah, just looking next to you, that person, just like, you just see this. Yeah. That's you... a lot of damage that we need to talk about. Like, we didn't see people's emotions for a year and a half. And it's also skin damage as well. The amount of acne that people broke out in with these masks, the amount of sweat and everything that, like, ugh, that, that, that's another, that was another thing that now that everyone's walking around with no mask, now you see the damage. Now you see right. the damage of wearing a mask all the time. You have people who have broken out everywhere. It was like being 15 all over again. <laughs> yeah. For the first couple of weeks, especially because uh, I, had, I had the N95, uh, Thankfully, for my you know, mother working in the uh, nursing home, she was able to uh, get me at least two of them because I was also doing DoorDash to make a little extra money at the same time. And when I was walking around with that N95 in the summertime, delivering stuff, mm, this, that, that N95 became a, a wet rag, basically, by the time right. it was done. And then the next couple of days, I would just little see just the little patterns of the breakouts everywhere. It's just, that was a real annoying part. We need to realize that our mental health was chipped away at a lot more than anybody was talking about. And we're coming back now, man, and things are feeling Thank good. You. I went out with Rob Rush last night. We had an event at the Paramount. I looked at him and I'm like, man, it is just so cool to have something to do like this again. We were talking to people, but you got to keep in mind that a lot of people, we went through a war. We all went through a war. It's not taking away what you have done, my friend, believe me. 
you you served our country. It's a completely oh, no, different. I, I, I literally just I I, for, I put a prior service. I don't even consider myself a veteran and all that stuff. It's, it's that's it. I only did my three years. I got my honorable. Like and compared to what real veterans do, I didn't do much. I just literally just showed up. That's basically all I fucking did. Yeah, you, you had a bigger set of balls than I did, my friend. That's <laughs> for sure. But it it's a. Uh, I'm 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 happy to see that things are bouncing back. That Long Island is starting to thrive again because the amount of mom and pop shops, especially that took a major hit over the this pandemic, it's a real shame because Long Island, certain parts of Long Island are really known for farm stands, long, mom yep. and pop shops, like little things that you can do that aren't necessarily because you're coming from the city most part, most of the time. People who vacation from the city are coming out here to Long Island to take a break from that aspect of seeing just every day, uh, what was it, the like regular companies like TJ Maxx, uh, uh, Macy's, all the other like major stores that you see, and, and compared to actually wanting to support a mom and pop shop, like it's it made it very yeah. hard to even help them out and support them. And a lot, unfortunately, a lot of businesses did go under, but I'm happy to see that some are actually reopening and got a grant to actually uh reopen again that's what was so amazing about the 1940s brewery reaching out to me they were shut down like everybody else they can only do curbside for beer and they came to me to want to help other people you know during times of need those that were in need were the ones reaching out to help others that's what made this thing so amazing yeah uh, it, it's it's also something that really it hits, like I say, it hits home for a lot of people. It's, I'm trying to find it really, but the, the, the exact word I'm looking for, it's on the tip of my tongue, but impactful. Like it, it's, it has a true, it's an, an impactful statement, not only just as a, uh, a beer, just everything that's on there, like just the whole symbol, the, the actual symbol, symbolic message that um, it has, it's not, necessarily the ne the negative aspect of drinking like when you drink that not you don't feel like you're having a drink you feel like you're actually right look the 1940s brewery was a place where i hung out at a lot i don't drink beer i didn't drink beer until they made this beer and i only drink it because you know i, I want to support what they do i'm a tequila guy yeah let's say you I, love your tequila on the rocks absolutely but i went to the 1940s brewery to hang out with friends that's all it was a place to go and listen to live music they had great acoustic bands i went there and drank water you know that's the the camaraderie that's why i wanted to do choose song at the brewery because i wanted to show a place where people could just get together it had nothing to do with drinking it's just about hanging out with your friends yeah it's honestly incredible and you said before you got you did, you're doing truck driving before how, how the hell did you come from truck driving into radio? <laughs> On accident. Um, <laughs> I moved to New Jersey in 2004, which other than the fact that started my radio career was tragic. Um, one day there was a commercial for a contest to a broadcasting school and I entered and I came in second, I lost. It was for a free scholarship. But then I figured, well, I came this far so I took out a bunch of loans. I got some friends to co-sign and I went to broadcasting school. One of my instructors took a liking to me and he, he put me on weekends in Atlantic City. And that was my first start. Wow. How was that? Like, work, how was it working out in Atlantic City? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know what the rating is on this podcast, brother, but it was <laughs> it was wild. It was eye opening. You know, every day broadcasting from a different uh, casino, the the people down there were wild. We did these booze cruises. One hundred two point seven WJSE. The station's no longer around, but as a matter of fact, they relaunched it under a different frequency and. The afternoon guy, Mark Thompson, is now doing mornings on the new JSC. So if anybody has a chance, I realize that I'm, you know, in competition with myself here. But it, those are nothing but great guys, and they taught me so much. And I, I wouldn't be in radio here on Long Island if it wasn't for my start there. And then how did you convert over here to Long Island from, uh, from Atlantic City? 
couple of the guys that wound up buying the radio stations in Atlantic City were from my high school. And I knew one of the owner's brothers. So we just started talking. He offered me a job to come back home to WRCN, which is also no longer available, uh, no longer around. And I didn't take it right away because I was in a bad headspace. And as much as I wanted to get out of New Jersey, I was trying to work things out with this girl I was with. We had been together for a while. So it took another year. And then finally, I just had enough and I emailed them and I said, hey, man, is there a spot open? And they put me on doing afternoons. So I did RCN for about a year, year and a half. Then I went to Westchester. I was really good friends with Rob Rush while I was in Westchester. So I would cover for him after the shark launched. I'd work in mornings. I'd work in morning radio in Westchester. And then when Rob was out, I would drive back home, stop in Farmingdale, fill in for him for five hours and then go home. And then when the position for mornings open, I ran with it. Did you've been at this position for about, I want to say five years, six years now? It's going to be seven in September. Seven in September. Yeah, I remember just coming back home from a basic training and immediately the first month of me being home, I had to take my sister to work uh, every time in the morning and you, it would be at eight o'clock in the morning and the drive there was about 30 minutes. Drive back home was about 40 minutes. So I would just catch literally the last t- like tail party or so every single morning. And then when uh, I actually met you up for that first time, I, it was completely random that I, I even turned on the radio because I wasn't even supposed to leave the car, but I went in because I had to check something for the car. And then I basically, when I turned up the radio, I heard the ad that you were down in Miller's and um, you were actually uh, giving out tickets to the Soul, Soul Asylum and uh, Fragile Mortals at the time. Yep. That was a great night. I, was, I, I never got a chance to actually really thank you, thank you for that night. But that was probably one of the best nights I've ever had. Me and my friend Jeff, like he, he, we, still, we still talk about that night. We even got a chance to talk to DMC, a legend like DMC. Not, but not, not that many people can say that, not that many people, not that many celebrities want to take that time to actually take pictures, hang out backstage and really- I've aged that night. I remember that. Yeah, in Napa Tandy's. Yeah. You know, Daryl, one of the greatest advocates for mental health that we have in this world. That dude is, I can't speak enough good things about him. He's always helped out. We did a telethon in November and Daryl drove from New Jersey just to be a part of it. Wow. Stayed for an hour. Told his whole story. I mean, he can motivate anyone into feeling better. That guy is so passionate about mental health and in that cover of I Just Called to Say I Love You that we did, it's it's Vinny from Sponge, Brendan from Weedis, and Daryl does a rap. If you type in I Just Called DMC, Daryl's in the middle of that video, freestyling, and it's, yeah, it's perfect. That. Like, oh, dude, it's, it's amazing. Let me know what you think. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware yeah, of that um, video. For, I wasn't aware of that. I, now, I, now I'm, I'm going to, as soon as this ends over here, uh, and I go off to the gym. I'm gonna watch it. I'm, I'm gonna watch it. Listen on the way into the gym, and in the gym. What? Well, I gotta run. We're yeah. getting to. to uh, we're approaching dinner time. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I'm approaching my gym time. I gotta. Well, I gotta climb anytime up five, you want to. I appreciate this. I appreciate. I can't thank you enough for having me on and being a part of this. So anytime you want to talk, bro, I'm here. It's not, honestly, and I, I can't thank you enough for having on. This is probably the, uh, the largest guest I've had, I want to say. Like, it's the largest following for a guest. And not only that, my, my family can really relate to you because everyone with my family listens to you. Every morning, my family, uh, I have a family who does uh, pool work. They do, they could drive out to the Hamptons, and every single morning, they're listening to you. So it's it's going to hit home with the family, <laughs> but it's also going to be pretty cool to be able to actually say that I had a real hour long conversation with you and really able to catch up also after you know, so many years, just brief conversations, quick hi, quick hellos, not to actually really get a, a full feel. Like it's, it's awesome. Like I genuinely do really do appreciate your time. I do appreciate that the most. Tell your family. I said, what's up? Hit me up during the weekend. We'll get together. Sounds good, brother, man. You take care. All right. Enjoy your dinner. Thanks for having me on brother. Be easy, brother, man.